Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, Gina, Vanessa, and Frank. It's been very interesting. I don't know what you think about that, but to me, I learned a lot because it's a topic I'm not an expert at all. I'm sure that you also learn a lot. I have to say that I'm happy to hear that some of you are working in assuring secure communications through this quantum key distribution, and I'm also happy to hear that they pointed out that they are at the good side of, yeah. the, <laughs> of, the, of the story and protecting us, which is, which is very good. And it's also nice when you talk about how we all can engage with this quantum world and quantum opportunities. So, yeah, they said we are going to be here. Just talk to us, send us an email, or, or just during the coffee break. So get the opportunity and try to find synergies between what you are doing and these uh, quantum technologies uh, opportunities. Thank you. No, good. I think that the next panel merges quite nicely with the recent conversation. We will be talking uh, around the intersection between cybersecurity and the space communication, and we can use that as an example of the application of quantum technology. But let's think about the problem a little bit more. Now, we are every day more and more reliant on space technology to do simple tasks like communication, navigation, and ourselves as a sector, we understand the complexities of trying to safeguard this technology. But my mom, my grandma, they don't really care if it's a satellite or it's me doing like that, the one that helps her to navigate. So we need to be sure that when we engage outside to the real world, there is these cybersecurity measures completely in place to help to create a sector that is reliable. So as I said, the, the table will be discussing the complexities of securing a space infrastructure and addressing the vulnerabilities that we have today in these networks. So I would like to, to open this, this panel that will be led by a group of experts, led by uh, my old friend Paul Guichem, who is the Director of Innovation in the Space Communications at Idoscat Foundation. He holds a master's degree from Cranfield University and UPC with a strong background in aerospace engineering in different roles, but also with a strong experience in the entrepreneurial role. So welcome to the stage and start this fascinating discussion. Thank you. So thank you very much for this introduction. Um, I'm glad to be here uh, one more year. And we have been speaking a lot about exponential technologies, but I'd like to highlight the exponential growth of this Congress as well. So thank you very much to all the organizations and all the implicated parties. But in this panel, we're going to address, as they said, cybersecurity in space. And cybersecurity is a huge topic. And it goes farther than just updating your email password from 1234 to something more secure. So what we're going to try to do in this, in this panel, I'll introduce the different panelists now, but is assess how this interrelates with space. So we have the honor to have uh, Javier Benedicto. Javier serves as the Director of Navigation and Connectivity and Secure Communications at ESA. He has a Master in Communications by UPC, and he has been at ESA for more than two decades, so quite a long time. He also um, he has done a notable contribution to the Galileo program, and he also holds, hold, holds an award for best, team, uh, for best Team at ESA and Dr. Honoris Causa from the Polytechnic of Valencia. So, um, Javier, would you like to make a short introduction of what you do at ESA right now? Yeah, good, good afternoon. And Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I would like to welcome everyone in Catalan, because I'm from Barcelona. So, thank you very much. Uh, what we do at ESA uh, in, in the field of uh, SATCOM, so we develop, uh, we, we research and develop uh, uh, SATCOM products uh, and systems. We, uh, partner with industry, with operators. We uh, develop uh, new technologies, we develop new services, and we're also working on the next generation of SATCOM systems. And we are also involved in the development of the Iris Square system, which was just referred to. Mm. On satellite navigation, we do just about the same. <laughs> and in terms of realization, so we have been developing the EGNOS uh, system, which is for safety of life, and Galileo over the past 20 years, which is now uh, an operational sy system. Thank you very much. We also have the honor to have uh, Arne, Arne Mathisen. He's the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer and the Vice President of Benelux at RIA Group. He holds a Master in, Aer in Aerospace Engineering uh, from the TU Delft. 
and he has also been working at other companies such as Trasis and Jaguar. He's responsible for the technology strategy and definition and implementation at RIA Group, but um, tell us, what do you actually do at, at RIA? So I'm the CTO or CTIO. Um, for me, it's important to provide to RIA, the whole RIA Group, now 900 people, uh, distributed over 10 countries, nine of them in Europe, uh, to make sure that they get some technical uh, leadership, technical governance, and um, although we've been around for 30 years, we take pride in the fact that we constantly reinvent ourselves. And it was mentioned already earlier today that the customer is key and the customer changes. Our environment changes, so within the 30 years we've changed a lot. Mm. Uh, we've changed from organization, but we've also changed from um, offerings that we have. So uh, mm. one of them that we take uh, great pride in is that since 2014, together with ESA mm. and together with uh, Belgium and Flanders, we started um, developing a cybersecurity for space. And at this point, I can say that REA Group is one of the leaders, uh, actors in Europe on cyber for space. Thank you. And we also have the pleasure to have uh, Juan Jose Grosso. Juan Jose has a strong foundation in telecommunications and satellite navigation. And and he has seamlessly transitioned from the engineering world to more strategic roles within the aerospace and automotive sectors. Currently, he's the CEO and founder of Osmium, and he's dedicated to bolstering cybersecurity in, our, in the aerospace industry. So tell us more, what, what do you do at Osmium? Yeah, yeah. first of all, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm happy and proud because in 2020 I was an attendee, now I'm speaking mm -hmm. here, so it's, uh, mm -hmm. it has been nice, a very nice three, three years. Uh, I'm an honor to, to share the, the stage with, with these uh, two experts. Uh, what we do in, in Osmium, we, we, we have started from the very beginning uh, supporting our customers, on, which are space companies and, and aviation companies, uh, on understanding. So we, we support them on understanding the, the risks and threats uh, of what the, their products or what their services uh, could, could be, uh, following a formal, let's say, process to help them in the process, so to, to, to be engage them and, and try to come up with uh, the risks and the, the risk mitigation to, to what they do. This is what we started, uh, and very recently we have also started with our R&D projects and on the development of our own solution for, for space, uh, so uh, secure ways for, for satellites. Perfect, thank you very much. Also, what we want to address here is, as we said, we are more and more reliant on space infrastructure, and the number of threats and vulnerabilities is also growing. So I'd like to ask our panelists, which is like, for you, the main threat that we could face and potential impacts of that threat? Um, Javier, if you, if you want to start. Yeah, I, I can start. I mean, we, we uh, give a lot of importance to the security of uh, space systems, uh, simply because they are used every day for many applications, so a system that is important has to work all the time, yeah. and it has to be robust. So security is about understanding what are the threats against which you have to be protected, and, but in order to translate this into design or technologies, you have to understand that the architecture of your system is what we call the vulnerabilities. So you need to understand uh, the infrastructure on ground and in space, uh, and then you also need to define what is the security target that you're approaching. Yeah. In a way, what is the risk, uh, the, the appetite for risk that you're ready to take? Mm. And this is all very much dependent upon the system and the service you want to provide. Mm. So there is not one solution for everything. Mm. We have to be very careful. Security, you can, brick, uh, you can build a, a very thick wall of bricks mm. or you can make it thin. Mm. Uh, it depends on what kind of uh, uh, security target you want to achieve. Uh, so I also want to underline that we need to protect the systems, so the infrastructure, but also the user. Mm. The user, which is somewhat disconnected from this infrastructure, mm. is also subject to threats. And uh, we also have a specific techniques which are applicable to protecting the user and the services that your user uh, is, is, uh, is, is actually uh, making use of. Huh? So that, that the two aspects are completely different mm. and we apply different techniques and technologies mm. on those aspects. The infrastructure on the one, side, uh, one hand and the services and the user uh, on the other hand. Okay. Arne, what are your, the main threat or the main vulnerability you're worried about? For me, it's not a specific technology threat or, uh, 
or anything like that. It's more the, the ever-expanding uh, attack surface right. that we're seeing. So we've heard a lot already today about the fact that the, the, the new space or our current space mm -hmm. environment and industry is very broad. There's new technologies, there's new innovations, there's new players, there is many more uh, interactions between the system and the infrastructures that we build. We will have IoT all over the place. Um, so in the end, um, all of these, these systems communicate with each other and they are hard to detach from each other. On top of that, we have the fact that the space in infrastructure in the past was scientific, was standalone. Mm -hmm. Now it is fully integrated with our terrestrial needs and services. So in that sense, if you sketch it like that, there's many sides on which we can be attacked. And this is what I think is a challenge for the, for the future. Yes, we need to know what kind of attacks are possible, what factors that uh, they might use, um, but just the vastness of mm. what we need to yeah. protect is for me a challenge, a challenge. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice thing to have, sort of, to, to do that as a company. But really, that, that, that is it. Uh, for me, that's the main thing that I'm sort of worried well, about. So yeah. The continuously increasing surface of attack. As, as, as you said, we come from um, space being accessible to some few actors. Um, and you had, and probably you had to have some very hard equipment to get, also like big antennas and so And now we are seeing like this future where any handheld device could be connected to a space asset. And therefore, as there are more of these assets, the surface of attack or anyone could potentially be a threat, right? On top of that, we have the, the digitalization that we all want. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's not simple hardware and mechanics anymore. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's digital. And the digitalization comes all the way from, from, the, from the supply chain already. Some of the things that we have, have been investigating is a supply chain attack mm. where the, an email is intercepted, where a drawing is included in to okay. actually to a to do a 3D print. Okay. And then you make just the wrong print, Thanks. but you don't see it so often. So it is many, many, yeah. many so it's types not, to protect. So it's not just the infrastructure that is deployed, but also like the whole value chain and the whole supply chain that makes that, that and infrastructure. The and the data that yeah. we communicate. Yeah. 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 I don't know if to be secure or to be worried about like <laughs> what you're saying. No. <laughs> Juan, um, what's, what's your main threat or your main worry or vulnerability that, that keeps you well, awake uh, at night? <laughs> yes, no, w w what I would pick up are some, some keywords that they mentioned uh, um, and, and add on, on the, the, the fact that it also depends on the attacker profile. So it depends on uh, who is trying to, to attack and what the resources they have. So it can be from, I don't know, a state sponsor or corporate sponsor attacker to an insider. Uh, and this uh, changes the possibility for them to exploit a, a, a specific threat that, that there is in the, in the system. So uh, what we do is to try to, to, to help the, the, the companies on understanding all this link. And, and one key, key thing that he mentioned, the dig digitalization and the um, the sharing of resources that were mentioned before, it was, uh, I think it was Rafael Jordá that, that mentioned uh, this uh, sharing of resources now is possible, in my opinion, from two main pillars of the new space that we are mentioning, which, which are the use of common of the shelf hardware, so simple hardware that is present that we, that we can use it, so which is not any more obscure or, or it's not any more, uh, let's say, uh, accessible to some mm. specific companies or, or, or countries, mm. um, and also the use of open source software. So these, these, two, these two things are making possible the sharing of resources, and for me, one of the, the biggest threats uh, that, that there will be in the, in the near future is these shared satellites, these shared payloads, these, uh, I, I was speaking with, with someone before, uh, that, that they are working on the possibility to share uh, a payload on a satellite for with, with, uh, within many, uh, let's say, interest parties, even universities. So this has to be protected somehow. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is one of the, of the key challenges. Uh, so that there are already companies going in, in this direction. Yeah. Cool. So just to mention, one thing that you mentioned, Javier, is that you're really worried on the infrastructure and how to protect it as well. Um, and we see um, that this space infrastructure is changing as well. It's evolving 
So from more like uh, dedicated systems to systems that could do more and more stuff. And we are seeing that, um, that's a vision that we are seeing is that it's very likely that this, that one single satellite will do multiple functions along its lifetime is something that we have been hearing also during this morning. Um, I guess that that increases the number of also threads and possibilities as you have like more players uh, or more actors using one of those assets. So that's something that might be also like a, a critical aspect, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, uh, we have to embed security in the design of our systems and we also need to appreciate that security is not, uh, a, is not a stable thing. It mm. changes every day, basically. The threads continue developing and the protection of our assets need to adapt to it. Mm. So we need to understand that most of our ground systems are software based. But they are also, when you have a satellite system like Galileo or Iris Square, it is worldwide distributed. We, have, we will have ground stations distributed around the world. The threat that you can have in a ground station in South Korea has nothing to do with the threat you can have in the Caribbean islands or, or in South Africa. So, and all of that is, is developing, is evolving in real time as we speak, basically. So also something which is very important is to have a security operation center, a security monitoring center, a place where uh, you are actually monitoring in real time uh, the, the data which is coming from the, uh, 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 all the sensors you have deployed in your ground assets and, and space assets in order to understand what is going on. We need to also make correlation rules in the sense that uh, maybe an attack, a cyber attack, uh, in two places which are very distant uh, uh, in, in, uh, geographically can actually have a very strong meaning mm. of something uh, of a risk which is developing mm. and we have to take action against it. So there are techniques which are very uh, based on the architecture of the system and I just give you one example. Mm. If we have uh, one of our ground sites uh, under attack, we, we have to be able to disable that site and the system has to continue to operate. It means that we may have to have uh, links between the satellites mm -hmm. in, in a sense that uh, the satellite is no longer dependent on that ground okay. station, but the information is passing through other satellites in order to ensure the continuity of the service. So there are lots of techniques which are not uh, traditional, I would say, in the banking systems or uh, in other, say, more day-to-day uh, say activities of our society, which are applicable to satellite systems, and it is the combination of those that achieves the necessary robustness yeah. uh, of the service. So having like these networks or like having this network mindset that one node of the network can fall and therefore the network still needs to still operate, that's something that we have to start thinking as well as increasing the or making satellites that are more autonomous. More autonomous, also software-defined radio satellites is very important because we can change things on ground very easily, mm -hmm. but we have to also change things in orbit. Mm -hmm. So we, changing things in orbit means reconfiguring the type of signal we are transmitting, reconfiguring the shape of the beams mm -hmm. which we are using, and all of that has to be adaptable, reconfigurable over the lifetime of a satellite which we are launching and it will be, uh, you know, operational for five to ten years. Mm -hmm. So this is the technologies we have to use. So we have already started with Javier talking about mitigations. Um, Arne, what other things can we do to make our space more secure? Well, one of the things I wanted to say, and it was already said, is yeah. the, the security by design. Right. So um, what we strive very hard for is to ensure that the, the security engineer becomes an in a security engineering domain, mm. just like the thermal domain or any other domain that you have in a, in a spacecraft uh, uh, development cycle. Mm. The, uh, the security mm. engineering domain has to be a real domain, mm. and that has to be included from the start. It is, it is uh, in the past, I hope we're changing now into the right direction, but in the past it was all too often that security requirements were added at the end, at great cost. So and too late sometimes. Okay. So we have to, we're moving away from that, um, even maybe in the ESA concurrent design facility where they do collaborative design, mm -hmm. uh, there should be a place for a, for a, for a security okay. engineer at the, around the table from the start, from what we call in space feasibility assessment, mm -hmm. phase zero. Um, then another thing that I think would, uh, what we strive and what we uh, preach um, is that we, we, we test before invest Mm. And so we have created a, 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 a tool 
which, is, uh, which allows you to do, make a digital twin of the infrastructure that you either, either already have mm. or that you are designing, mm. and then to test it immediately on the fly so, uh, for, for known threats. Mm. And uh, when I say digital twin, there's many diff definitions of digital twin. Mm. The one that we, uh, that we are using for our customers is, a, is sort of an emulation platform mm. that allows you also to plug in hardware. For example, we've used it for, uh, for an ESA project called uh, Traleo, mm. in which we do RF uh, jamming and spoofing. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, but we needed a satellite. So we had a hardware satellite <coughs> emulation mm -hmm. box in uh, uh, linked. And I think we've also linked it to the, to the STEC RF lab. Mm. Um, so vir virtualizing first what you want to do, testing it on the ground, mm. from the moment you think it's quite safe for now, mm. because as we said, threats change, you fly your, 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 your infrastructure or your system, but then you keep your digital twin like an engineering model in the past, you know, mm. to see when things change, when new attacks come, do I launch them on the virtual twin? What is the, what is the effect? and how can we mitigate in, in real life. So that's, that's a really interesting idea. You're talking about having kind of like a sandbox where you could just <coughs> use it to actively simulate attacks or see how can, exactly. can people could actually create these, uh, these threats to that system. That's actually quite interesting. And it goes a bit in line with what you were saying also in terms of like uh, o using open source schemes. Is what you're seeing in your opinion, is open source, like using open source is like a mitigation because it's open and anyone can actually see and contribute, or in certain aspects can, can you know, you're exposing too much information about how the system works? No, it, if it is, well, uh, if it is correctly used, it's good. Yeah. Uh, so open source per se is, let's say, not, uh, it, it can create new vulnerabilities, but you have to take very into account, and, and, and for this there is the, the security by design, for this is that companies like, like, our, like ours, uh, support the, the customers and understanding what the what the the use the implication of using these things uh, would be into their product or or their service. So it's not per se a, a, a vulnerability to to use that. Yeah. I, to, if I can uh, yeah. add something, it, I don't think the the solution is always in a technical solution, mm -hmm. uh, because we also need to start sharing information. And it seems to be very difficult in industries to share information about cyber attacks, um, even about how you solve what? to get out of a, of a, of a cyber issue. So um, there is some initiatives currently ongoing, I think also from ESA, but also from the EU, uh, to, to, to create what we call space uh, information sharing and, um, and analysis centers, mm. where specific sectors like space would actually share their, uh, their, their experience yeah. with, with certain attacks in such a way that we can then prevent it to happen to somebody else. Yeah? This, of course, in a commercial environment, mm. is not, we're not used to helping our, our competitors so, uh, mm. so much, but it's for the, for the good of everything, everybody in this mm. case, mm. especially, as I said, with a huge uh, attack surface, yes. we need to help each other not to be the victim. We are so intertwined that if one of us falls over, it could very well be that we all fall over. So it is about information sharing and obviously awareness and training. Yeah, uh, as you're saying, I think awareness is it's key here as a mitigation strategy because as you said, often on this engineering project, is you're more focused on like making it work than in making it work securely. As you said, secure, making it work securely, the securely part comes at the end. And maybe when it's too late or when you already suffered some attacks. Um, in your career, have you seen any situation where you've been like um, in that threat or in that in in that attack uh, that you could share, obviously? Or <laughs> yeah. well, for for us, uh, not yet. So don't try. <laughs> but we've been in the situation that a customer comes to us and says, "Look, I have this system, and it's it's done. It costs me uh, hundreds of millions, mm -hmm. and it's not secure. What do I do?" And like, oh, then you have to spend another 20 million to make yeah. it secure, you know? So we've had these situations that we have encountered the, the, the issue that security late, was not, not taken into account, yeah. yeah. Cool. Also, you were referencing, like, um, the sharing fact. And the space sector has been always very collaborative. 
although as Geraldine was pointing earlier this morning, we are seeing some geopolitical trends that may go in the other direction right now. Um, Javier, what's your view on what Europe is doing in, in these new trends like China positioning? Well, first of all, the disruption of Starlink um, providing this, this, this private uh, service, but it's quite influenced by the United States. And then China positioning themselves like we're not going to allow Starlink service within China and we're going to provide, we're going to develop our own constellation. What's your view? What's Europe doing about? I, I think the geopolitical uh, events uh, of the past years have uh, actually demonstrated the need uh, for a certain dimension of sovereignty, autonomy, mm -hmm. uh, control of your supply chain, control mm -hmm. of technologies. I mean, we were not able to equip ourselves with uh, face masks when uh, the COVID uh, uh, occurred. We had to buy it from uh, very far away. So it boils down to very simple things. Uh, we saw also the problem in producing chips, which affected uh, a large variety of uh, uh, sectors of our economy, etc. So the, the institutions in Europe are paying a lot of attention to that, and I think this is uh, absolutely vital, mm. because you see how fragile, how vulnerable we are when something suddenly occurs, you realize you are not prepared for it. Right. Just simply because it's very easy to rely on the cheapest thing that is provided from anywhere, mm -hmm. but when, when you cannot rely on that anymore, mm -hmm. then you suddenly don't have it. Yeah. Yeah? And I just want to give one example. I was in the US a couple of weeks ago in the, uh, in the um, a major navigation conference, and there is a discussion about whether these uh, constellation systems, uh, which are consisting of thousands of satellites, can also generate uh, position navigation and timing services, uh, as opposed to GPS Galileo. And the reaction of the audience was, well, I mean, this is all very nice, maybe technically it works, but do you want, do you as a user, do you want to depend on one person yeah. Yeah. Uh, in order to be able to navigate from home to this place or to be able to fly aircraft or to guide the trains or to control your energy network, etc.? We are depending so much on space applications that it must work all the time. Mm. And to work all the time, it is, as you were saying, not only a technical issue, mm. it is also an issue of uh, how do you get organized, who is providing the reliance, the necessary robustness, mm. and the guarantee that the service will be there all the time. Mm. And this engages, you know, uh, lots of things of which cyber protection against cyber security mm. is one of them, mm. but also the the robustness of the supply chain, as we say, the controlling the key technologies, mm -hmm. designing security and protection from the outset and not approaching it at the end. Mm -hmm. All of this requires having policies, mm -hmm. regulatory environment, mm -hmm. protecting our spectrum. All of this is at the end of the day contributing mm -hmm. to having real robust services from space to our users on ground. And Europe is... Um using Iris Square program to foster that within, within the European community, right? Uh, Iris Square is now the uh, initiative, is the response, I would say, of the European institutional sector mm. to which the, the EU, European Commission, is driving, but ESA is associated with that, and mm. many governments in Europe are really supporting the, the initiative because we realized, we also saw it during the Ukrainian crisis, mm that our governments were very fragile uh, in that respect. Uh, so we must have uh, a certain amount of control over basic uh, infrastructure and services that we can always rely upon. Oh. And this is not in contradiction or in competition with private initiatives. Mm -hmm. It is just complementary to it. Both things are important. important. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to add on this and, and, and something that is very important to, to start doing making an analogy from, from my previous experience in, in automotive cybersecurity, uh, it was only possible to start speaking about cybersecurity with different layers, so with the OEM, with the tier one, mm -hmm. tier two, only when there was a, a standard and there was a regulation. This is not present at, at this moment in the, in the aerospace sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are following, let's say, best practices. We are following standards from other industries mm -hmm. or for avi from aviation or from uh, the, the, um, the automotive industry, uh, and once we can speak all the, the, the same language, small companies, big companies, and, and, and with ISA, for instance, mm. uh, I think it would be uh, easier and, and, and easier for us to, to evangelize or, or to, to make the customers understand why, why cybersecurity is, is needed. So, yeah. so you're seeing kind of like a lack of um, 
legal framework or at least a certification level maybe of what companies need to be. So because we have best practices mm -hmm. and we can, as you said, onboard people from other industries, but you're seeing like there's, there's like a lacking, uh, there's like a particular certificate that we could maybe see on other industries such as the banking industry or the automotive industry. So in space, mm -hmm. we still don't have like a certificate that says, hey, my system is secure. It's, it's yes, at least decently secure, oh. but, but no, not that much entry into, into certification, but at least uh, what I saw in the automotive industry when there was ISO 21434, which is a standard for oh. cybersecurity, you could speak, uh, I don't know, with, between companies and yeah. between your colleagues the same language. Yeah. So this is not present because maybe Rhea sees the cybersecurity in, in some particular way and we, we see it in another way. Mm. So it's uh, having... A, a common understanding would be easier, and, and I think in this, in this direction, what <coughs> the, the, the European Commission is doing with the European Space Law mm -hmm. uh, could help this, mm -hmm. because one of the, the pillars in, in which is, it is uh, based is uh, resilience. So there are three pillars, safety, resilience, and sustainability. Mm -hmm. And in the case of resilience, uh, it, it has to do with cyber security. Mm -hmm. And we have on top of that the, the NIST directive and NIST 2 directive, which they have launched uh, recently. Mm. So all of this, it, it's, it starts yes. because uh -huh. uh, we realize that we have to indeed talk the same language, mm. be able to measure each other of whether you're doing the right thing or not and whether I want to go with you as a supplier or somebody else. So it, it, is, it is indeed starting. And, uh, and several of the member states of Visa, or actually European, uh, one of them is Luxembourg, they're actually also very interested in looking at <coughs> cybersecurity certification sure. to see how can we certify yeah. something that you uh, that is cyber secure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, that's that's one of the main uh, uh, uncertainties as well. And uncertainty is also like a, a vulnerability. Like, I am I secure? What I have to do to validate that my system is secure? Or as you were saying, if someone makes, as we were saying, like space is uh, increasing its touch points. How do I know that my part of the system is going to fit well with with the other uh, security requirements, right? In a certain yes. with, with the understanding that maybe today you are secure and tomorrow you are no yeah, longer no, yeah. secure. secure. So I want to underline right. this dynamic nature of security, which is extremely problematic. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. And we need to, because there are lots of people around who, whose only interest is to try to penetrate, yes. try to break, try to stop try to flatten yeah. something that is important. Huh? Uh, we are in this kind of world, huh? unfortunately. Uh, and, and as Arne was saying, it's like sharing. Uh, should we, uh, in a sense, like make, because as, as you were saying, whenever there's like a, a cyber security attack, not in space, but also in other industries, there's very little to know. I mean, the, the people go very secure. Maybe you know that it's a ransom attack, or maybe you know that's uh, another type of attack, but you don't know how it's solved uh, so most of the time. So is like uh, making this discussion more open on security important? Or it is, from my point of view, very yeah. important. Uh, we have the notion of the certs. Yeah. The certs are centers which are collecting intelligence centers, which are collecting on a daily basis mm -hmm. all what is going ar uh, around the world, uh, going on, on cyber. Mm -hmm. Uh, they make uh, this information available under certain conditions because mm. we also need to understand that security is at the core of national Inter safety and yeah. security. Mm. Huh? And uh, this is, of course, very sensitive information. Mm. So you, you also have to be accredited in order to be able to have access to the information. You need to demonstrate you have a, so, something which is called a need to know. Mm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Not anybody can have access mm. to the information. So you have to belong to a circle of people uh, and, and this is extremely dynamic and we also need to understand that uh, because our systems are very much software based, mm. uh, the, the code in our systems has to evolve dynamically. So we have to employ uh, agile techniques uh, of uh, 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 developing patches uh, in, our, uh, in the software which then flows into the operational infrastructure without uh, interrupting the service. Huh? Yeah. This is really a, a 360 yeah, yeah. degrees thing huh? from the detection of the threat, right. which appears maybe in North Korea, uh, information flowing into the CERT uh, in France, in Paris, this information flowing almost in real time uh, to, our, to ourselves and to our industry, developing the patch and flowing the patch into the operational infrastructure. This in, is, in this is what it's about. Real time. In real time. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, when I started in space, I, it used to be like you were developing the software for a satellite and you were putting it there and... And that's it. Perfect. And that's it. And um, if, unless there was like something really, really critical, it was like don't mess up with the software satellite because, you know, it's, as you were saying, have, it's really difficult to access and just reboot it, you know. It's, and you're right that as uh, space assets are basically computers in space these days, um, we have to learn quite a lot also. Like, I mean, the, the good thing is like there's the software industry um, has also been in that situation where we can learn a lot. And as you were saying, like continuous integration and continuous deployment is, is key here, right? Yeah. I also want to introduce a concept of, um, and, and I know that I'm aware of time, um, the ethical hacking or the white hat hackers, um, is that a role that, I mean, they're in the software industry they're trying to, because sometimes, it's, as you were saying, like open source it's fine, but there needs to be like this uh, willingness to contribute, this willingness to uh, don't go behind doors and just instead of like being the good guy. So instead of like se selling that information of a threat to like, uh, you know, like the bad guys, you will have to go raise your hand and say, hey, I've seen like this vulnerability. Is that something that we should also try to increase? Like in the, there are some initiatives in the software world, more in the software world, but should we also make that conscious on, on, on the whole audience on, should be aware of like this ethical hacking in space as well. For me, yes. I mean, the, the word ethical in the ethical hacker should make sure that he does his job in the correct way. Yeah. Um, and the exercise of the blue team, red team attacks, yeah. um, or a single ethical hacker trying to attack is, is very, 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 uh, it's worth a lot for the owner of the system. So. It is, uh, it, it's, it, yeah, these guys, we have several, uh, we need them. Yeah. And, and also they need to be trained, which is a bit strange because you need to train them to, to hack systems. Uh, so they need to be aware of what the bad guys uh, do. But they are a, a very good source um, of information for an infrastructure owner. Yeah. yeah. And, and to, to add on that, uh, also, Let's say that this um, this was seen in the in the in the automotive industry before, and, and many OEMs then after the the first big attack of a big OEM, many of them started doing uh, let's say allowing pen testing Thanks. or exactly. let's say uh, playing with their cars. <laughs> so basically, uh, when when in the company where I was working before, uh, we we did that in in, in some vehicles, and <coughs> it it was very interesting to see uh, how something that, that actually happened. So it was a problem, big OEM, they lost a lot of money. Right. And, and then from, from that point, the, everything started to work, uh, let's say, as smoother, uh, in a more smooth way for, for, the, um, uh, for the sake of, of, a, of more secure yeah. systems. Yeah. So hopefully we will not see a big attack right. in, the, in the space industry, but I, I would say that something will happen. Uh, so the the keys for all big companies and, and, and uh, small satellite operators or big satellite operators to be prepared to what's next after that happens. So yeah. this is this is key and and this is the, the basis of this. We, we I, I came to the to the very uh, very first word. It's security by design. Fine. Is key. Yeah. I, I really like what you said about the training because. Uh, ethical hackers on the software world, they learn because they have access to those infrastructures. So anyone can try to, you know, hack the NASA website or, you know, because it's there, it's accessible. Um, space is less accessible. Should we think about like providing those kind of laboratories or infrastructures more open? So for me, for me, that's part of uh, the cybersecurity labs and the certification mm -hmm. labs and uh, that we are all trying to set up and that seem to, to, to raise some, uh, some attention and interest. Mm -hmm. But also this, this digital, cyber digital twin, so mm -hmm. that you don't have to hack your operational mm -hmm. system because mm -hmm. actually five years ago, we, we had a, a proposal to ESA mm -hmm. to hack an existing satellite. Mm -hmm. uh, then we said <laughs> no, because that satellite is actually really being used. Yeah. So we don't want you to touch that. Uh, which is completely understandable, but if you then virtualize it in, and, and emulate it, mm. which is very close to reality, you can even feed it with real data coming from mm. the same the satellites, <coughs> and then let these guys go full on that on that mm. uh, virtual infrastructure and see uh, how they can break it. Cool. So just to close, I'd like to um, 
what would be your final recommendation to the audience regarding cybersecurity um, very quickly, Arne? Uh, security by design. Security by design. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Build, build it in, uh, in the architecture, in the technology, and, and be mindful that it is never done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And from my side, to something that, that Vanessa mentioned before also, uh, no solution fits all. So mm -hmm. you, you have to have layers of security, and it really depends on what is important in your system or your service to, to be protected. Okay. So you, you, the, the customer needs to, to see what is uh, necessary to be protected. So thank you very much, thank and you. thank you for the audience. And um, yeah, cybersecurity never stops. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>